the depressant. They abandoned it for financial reasons, but not for pharmacological ones. So it's interesting to see that I was looking for the wrong thing. And there's a case for my report in relationship with the, the chemical is totally wrong. I was looking for something and I was not getting it and I was not being open to what was there. I learned a lesson from that. And now I'm willing to, to listen a little bit more instead of calling the shots when I get into new materials. But this is alpha ethyl. Stop the psychedelic ex experience. Then get back into what is it that mescaline has other than that. It's a beautiful group sort of hanging over here like shrubbery. What else is in nature that has similar shrubbery? Nutmeg, parsley, apio, dill apio, marvelous essential oil. So into the spice cabinet, you know, hauling out all these marvelous things, distilling them, getting marvelous oils, and converting them to substitute amphetamines. And by golly, they're becoming every, almost everyone is active. The methylene dioxy, the one from Sacro, became MDA. The one with the methoxy methylene dioxy became MMDA. I found dill APO, I called it tetramethoxy or methylene dioxy dimethoxy amphetamine, oh, a host of letters. DMMDA, I can give you letters all ending with A. They were absolutely fascinating. Then he said, well, all of these are active, but the thing is, all of them have groups can easily be taken off by the body. They all have groups that are hooked through an oxygen. What if you took out the oxygen and put a group directly on the ring? Well, this is not found in nature. This is new territory. So in the lab, you know, the tweezers take off the oxygen, jam on a, a methyl group, and you have something that's, that now is a material that is totally unnatural. It's the first time I'm getting into something that is totally away from a natural guide. My argument is this material with, a, with this absent, this metabolic... Uh, position of metabolic, metabolic fragility and having really a fixed group on there, this could go two ways. This, this compound could be a really potent compound because you can't metabolically get rid of the group at a position where it's necessary. Or it could be totally without activity because it's getting in there but getting rid of the group is necessary to be active. I don't know. Totally unknown. So I go in there cautiously. If it's going to be really active, I'm going to have a fascinating compound. If it's totally inactive, I might have something in the therapeutic a value maybe it's an antagonist. Maybe something could be used to treat a person who's overdosed on something that is active. Get this jam in the, the lock with a key that doesn't quite work right and maybe protect a person against poisoning or against overdose. And if there's anything to, uh, to an endogenous psychotogen, something that causes illness from something that comes out from within the body of due to biochemical mismanagement, maybe this could be a therapeutic tool to mental illness. Hell, really, it's just a shine the glory. I can't lose. I love question three, can't lose. <laughs> so I went into a caution that turned out to be an extremely potent compound. I called it DOM. It got out in the streets in 1967 under the name of STP. And lead probably was the material that did more damage to the psychedelic movement in its own way because it more or less crystallized the move to making all these materials illegal. It was badly abused in San Francisco. How it got in the street, I don't know. I presented it in a meeting in, in, um, in uh, Johns Hopkins, which is in Maryland. But somehow there's communication I'm not aware of. And it was appeared within, a, within I'd say, about six months in the streets of San Francisco and was abused. An uh, effective dose of STP is maybe four, five, six milligrams. It appeared in the street in 20 milligram tablets. And the difficulty is it is slow to onset. And uh, after about an hour, with only a little thing occurring, and the person would take another one or two 20 milligram tablets. And there were dosages coming into the hate ashbury of 40 and 60 milligrams, or handfuls, so to speak, of a material totally unknown. It was a very, very difficult time. And then they found half tablets and quarter tablets were much more effective, but the, the image of a negative material had been pretty well cast into, into, uh, into social concrete at that point. So this was a, it was a difficult area. It turns out, again, I love my crazy glue and, and carbon atoms, so I made the methyl group out there into an ethyl material called D. I originally called it DOE. Uh, as uh, I love the DO argument for DOM at methyl, DOE for ethyl. Then a, a friend of mine mentioned DOE has already been used for desoxyephedrine, which is a code name for methamphetamine. And that didn't sound right, so I called it DOET. And just as well, because I got up the amyl compound, it would be DOA, which is dead on arrival, which is not, <laughs> not a, a good code anyway, so DOAM. This whole family peaked at about, about two or three carbons, and I found um, uh, the old, old chemical adage is good in here. There's a whole family known as methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, and other such names as you get the carbon chain longer and longer. And the old adage is uh, methyl, ethyl, and propyl, butyl, futyl. And it turns out that this is very true. About two or three carbons. The simplest of the series is rarely the most interesting or the most rewarding. And as you get more complex, you get into complexity at many different levels. It's usually the next to simplest that is, is, is the treasure. I don't know if this is a general rule, but it seems to work out that way very, very nicely. So from there, 
into other derivatives, other substitution patterns. Uh, one of the early things I was playing with was the uh, taking the glue pot and putting a methyl group on the nitrogen. After all, methamphetamine is very much like amphetamine, except it is more easily accepted. It doesn't quite have the jingles and jangles and the hair standing on end and the teeth grinding and the, and the high blood pressure and the push of amphetamine. And in, in street usage, methamphetamine has been always been preferred. And so what about the methyls of a lot of these compounds? I made methyl STP and I made methyl TMA and TMA2 and all of them were without activity with the one exception of methyl MDA. And that one was a stimulant of a different type, but it was not a psychedelic. This is material that I finally published the uh, human work on under the name of MDMA, which is then became completely out of hand under the name of Adam and Ecstasy and everything else. But that was, in essence, again, an exploratory area of putting different things on here and there to check the activity in the shrubbery, not knowing what's going to come out, but looking always at what type of thing you're going to work out in your relationship with a with new compound. So this is more or less a picture of, I think my, my hour must be near. What is our time? Uh, oh, yeah, more time. Five, five more minutes. Five. 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 Uh, so this is kind of a, a general picture of, of the varieties of psychedelics that I've, I've worked with over, over a number of years. Uh, they say there are about a couple, three hundred of them that are in there. Most of them in the, in the scientific literature. I'm a great believer in publishing. I think it's one of the most marvelous ways of slowly getting this entire area into a an eventual position of being respected. It is a very it's a very frightful area to many many people. It is uh, for some reason a very frightful area to to the medical community, except those who are a minority who who are are intrigued with it both from the theoretical and from the personal point of view. It is a frightful area into, into people's power, into people in an administrative position, as can be seen by the rather uh, dogmatic laws that are, have recently been passed against research in the area. The, the recent, I think one of the more uh, difficult uh, moves was the, was the uh, hysteria this, just this last year, the passing of what's called the Anti-Drug Enforcement Law, 1986 in uh, October was signed. <clears throat> it has about 10 or 12 sections in it, but it has uh, it's about 10 or 12 acts. It's a law with about 10 or 12 acts. But two of them, I think, are uh, very, very difficult to live with, and I think are potentially very dangerous. And I'd like to close up this first half by mentioning what is now law and aspects of it that I see as being difficult to be at peace with and still feel that uh, the right thing is being done in the area of addressing the drug abuse problem. One of them is the way the possession and the penalties that affect cocaine, agonine, different drugs akin to cocaine. They have passed law, the new law makes mandatory penalties. I mean, if you possess a mixture that contains five grams of free base cocaine, you have a mandatory, I think it's five years in prison and some number of millions of dollars I've lost. I do sense of, of money when you get over that many zeros. Uh, if you this amount of cocaine, as they say cocaine when they review the law, and that amount of cocaine, 10 years, 20 years, $4 million, $8 million penalty, mandatory, but it's not 5 grams of cocaine. It's 5 grams of a mixture that contains cocaine. Stop and think about that for a moment. You can take a bottle of Coca-Cola and have a 25% chance. I assayed four and found cocaine in one of them. You have a 25% chance of having five grams of a mixture that contains cocaine. It is a law that is going to be enforced in a very capricious and a very, very uneven way. You are not going to be able to take some person who is a, 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 the rabbi at the local synagogue up on court and have 12 peers say that he's guilty of a 10-year in the prison crime because he drank a bottle of Coke. The jury is not going to do it, and hence the law is not going to be enforced. But you get some, some character who's been tweaking the nose of the authority for 10 years in a paisley painted psychedelic VW bus, and it will be enforced. So it's a difficult law because it says anything that contains. The, a good friend of mine who is in the, uh, in the uh, government laboratories uh, challenged one of the arguments of cocaine on $100 bills. They had seized a big bag of $100 bills that contained cocaine. By assaying the bills, they found cocaine. $100 bills containing any amount of cocaine represents the weight of the entire thing can be considered as cocaine. So they seized it. So he went down and struck a bargain with the uh, Federal Reserve Bank. It was after bank closing hours, but he had uh, enough clout to be able to get to them. and said, I would like to borrow for about a half an hour $20,000 of $100 bills. 
said, what for? I said, I'll just, I'll bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he, he maneuvered and he got them and he took the suitcase, a couple of very heavily armed narcs along on either side of him, went back to the narcotics lab, extracted the dichlor, took the $100 bills back, slightly faded, but un the account was intact, returned them, no problem, ran the dichlor and found cocaine. So in essence, taking $100 bills at random gave cocaine. So the presence of cocaine on, a, on money cannot be used with the same confidence that this money was involved in a cocaine transaction. The old argument was, here's a suitcase, here's your white crystal solid, here by $100 bills, I've dumped in the same suitcase, of course they get jiggled on the way to the bank, and the $100 bills get infused with this, this fine white dust, and you can find it there. I would imagine cocaine is like nicotine, is like DDT, it's everywhere in our environment. And I, I know that I've done this as a demonstration in the hospital in San Francisco. You take a swipe and you run it down the window, and you take that swipe and you'll find nicotine, you'll find DDT. It is everywhere in our environment. It's in you. And you take a little fat from the, the behind, you're going to find DDT and you're going to find nicotine. I bet you're going to find cocaine, because it's like, like muni diesel dust. It's everything that's in the environment all around you. And polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and carcinogens as well. And that's one aspect of the law that bothers me. California has enacted the same law that a mixture that contains any quantity of, they're all, they're completely gung-ho about crack. Crack was the thing in the newspapers just before that law was signed, just before the elections last November. If you remember, there were elections last November, and there was a crack scare last November. I don't remember a great deal since November. I, I just, I, it's not been much in the newspapers, but crack has now been a special category of ugliness. Crack is nothing but cocaine. Free-based cocaine and crack are identical. But free-based cocaine requires this law, and crack requires this law. They're the same thing. I mean, the mischief that can go on from the legal point of view is, is rather rough here. The other aspect of the law I find to be very disturbing, and this will be my point for, for, for a break, is that it in essence has taken research in, human, in humans in any area of pharmacology out of the hands of the medical community and has put it in the hands of the FDA. The law says that the following shall be considered analog substances. They've gotten away from the term designer drugs, but this, it was originally called humorously designer drug law or the Tim Leary Amendment uh, at, during the hearings. Uh, a, an analog or designer drug is anything that meets this, this, or that. But the main this and this is it shall have a structure that is substantially similar to that of a Schedule One or Two drug. First, it shall not be a Schedule One or Two drug. It is not to be a Schedule drug. Any compound you get that is substantially similar to a Schedule One or Two drug, if you think for a moment, anyone who's delved into the marvelous recesses of rhetoric knows the term disclaimer. I, I, love, the, I love disclaimers myself. It gets you off the hook. You can say something but not quite say it. Yeah. I worked with a person once who actually, in a written sentence, put three of them in one sentence. <laughs> he said, uh, we will probably first ship this thing to you in a week to ten days, number two, or two weeks at the latest. And it's, a, it's a masterpiece of three of them. Now, what is substantially similar? Similar, I know. This is similar to that. You know, this has a tail, that has a tail. This is four wheels, that has four wheels. Similar. Substantially the same, I know. This is substantially the same as that. It's got a tail, it's a tail. Six wheels, six wheels. I mean, substantially, substantially similar. It's a double disclaimer. And I don't know, I honestly, in my heart, don't know what is meant in the mind of the person who wrote that into the law. It is in the law. Substantially similar. It sounds like it's going to mean what you want it to mean. Is a, a good example, which I came across from my class on pure impulse about three weeks ago. I believe that all the taillight structures of all cars, of all makes of the last four years, are substantially similar. <laughs> and, you know, if you think about it, you know, there's red up there, there's white down here, there's yellow over here on the side. Some have it this way, some have it that way. They all play about the same function. They're all replaced at about the same 50 or $100 per piece of glass. They all have about the same colors. They all go on when you hit the brakes, so they have about the same behavior, but they're all different. When I was young, I could glance and say, oh yes, that's a 1932 Chevrolet. You could tell the car by the taillight. And I imagine there are people now who, who find that to be a very rewarding thing to do, to be able to walk down a sidewalk and say, ah, there's a 1967 Camaro, there's a 1983-something. They're all signatures. They're all substantially similar in that sense. But what if you said anything that was substantially similar to the taillight of a 1983 Oldsmobile, substantially similar in structure, and which is a stimulant 